that's where it all began. Get, getting that first place through shared ownership was just very much on a wing and a prayer. I just know this is something I want to do. And there was no training. There was no formal stuff. There was just figure this out. I think one of the real advantages I had actually was starting young. Time was the thing that gave me the ammunition to scale up and do the next thing. And a lot of the conventional wisdom would say operate within a small niche and solve a small problem and do it better than anyone else does it, right? And it just didn't materialize in that way for me with Stacked. By surrounding yourself with all the right people, never getting complacent, being tuned in, and I think staying humble enough to accept that you don't have all the answers and your next big mistake could be tomorrow. In my case, at least, this has helped me stay somewhat grounded as I've tried to navigate through things. Anyone who says don't buy property, I think um, take it with a pinch of salt or just completely disregard it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Property People. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Charlie Tarr. How are you today, Charlie? I'm good, Sam. Thanks for having me along. Thank you for coming. Um, I really wanted to have this chat. I bumped into you not too long ago at the uh, Brendan Quinn uh, Central London Property Meet. It's, a, it's a, an event that I frequent. And you were doing a presentation, and I thought that it's very fitting for where we are in the marketplace. Uh, and in in the zeitgeist of uh, of humanity, um, but just a quick intro before we jump into all that. Uh, you're a property investor in your own right, uh, now a prop tech startup founder. Um, there's a lot of talk in the market in the world about AI and technology and and how that's kind of helping us. So I thought it would be a great idea for you to come and share all of that uh, with us and a little bit about your background. Um, but before we go into all that as well. Who were you at school? What sort of person was Charlie at school? Did you enjoy school? Did you always think that you'd be a prop tech tool founder? Um, were you a straight A student at school? Were you kind of like, did you enjoy going to school? Um, I was, and I did. Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> yeah is, the, is the sort of concise way of answering that. I worked hard, certain things came somewhat naturally to me, uh, and I enjoyed it a lot. I found it rewarding, you know? So yeah, it was a, it was, it was a good fun and time. And did you go off under higher education, A-levels, university, that sort of thing? Yeah, I was at King's College in London and I did a philosophy degree, which has had oh. absolutely no bearing on anything really? <laughs> I've done since. But I think it's all a bit of an exercise in learning how to think clearly, think effectively, and then be able to articulate that either through spoken word or in writing. And actually that as a sort of universal skill set has been incredibly useful in business because I do like to take the approach of trying to reason a problem th through. And particularly when things get challenging and stressful and unexpected stuff happens, having the ability to just kind of like take a breath, stay calm, wake up early one morning and write all of that out as to pros, cons, threats, analysis, you know, rational approach, I think quiets the the self-doubt that creeps in a lot of the time and helps make sense of really complex challenging situations i think that that is a good skill set i do agree that kind of higher education university does teach you is critical thinking uh, project planning um trying to weigh up arguments um and and it sounds like even the philosophy degree certainly on that level did uh, did help you with where you are today in the analytical side of business yeah I, I would say, although university for me was very little studying, actually. By the time I'd finished school, I'd done most of that stuff, acquired most of those skills. And actually, I was working, you know, full time by the, by 18, 19. And university was a bit of a sideshow. Right. Um, so, so kind of agree and disagree in a way where up until 18, 19, very much so. But after that, I was ready to rock and roll and make some things happen in, in a business setting as well. And uh, what were you doing for work at 18, 19? So I was working with a friend of mine who owns a big betting company in the UK, and he's gone on to be you know extremely successful in his own right. And um, he, having been involved in a very risky business, uh, had the idea that he wanted to start putting some of his profits into property and it was my job to find a way of deploying his funds into buying buildings and doing all that type of stuff so it's a wonderful opportunity for me at 18 19 to start doing that learning the ropes and playing you know with someone else's money in, in a yeah, sense yeah, yeah. um and you know the more I got into it and saw his success I just thought well this is something I've got to get into as well so that was where the the the, the seeds started to kick off Got it. Yeah, because property. Uh, one of my questions was going to be from philosophy to property. Why property? Why not stocks, shares? Why not 
uh, crypto or I mean, crypto might not have uh, been around back when you started, but when di when did you start in property? So what year was that? Yeah, uh, so I bought my first property in 2009, not far from here. Um, Just after the crash. Exactly right. So I started university in 2008 and I was in these squalid halls of residence in <laughs> Camberwell and I thought this is not the life for me. So how is it that I'm going to get myself on the property ladder here? And that's when they were doing the um, redevelopments out by the Olympic Park, you know, all that kind of stuff, building up to the 2012 yeah, yeah, Olympics. Yeah, absolutely. Right on our doorstep here. Yeah, and there was a place just in the Royal Victoria docks that they were redeveloping, shared ownership scheme. I got in there, you know, really low deposit when you factored it all. And that was that second year of university. I moved into my own place and nice. just kept going from that point forward. And so tell us about the property investment journey before we jump into the the tool that you've created yep. um what you know tell, talk us through those steps that you took through 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 property investment yeah so that's where it all began get, get, getting that first place through shared ownership was just very much on a wing and a prayer how am i going to i just know this is something i want to do basically yeah, yeah, yeah. um and there was no training there was no formal stuff there was just figure this out and and i did that and that that was great um, and then I watched it go up a little bit in value. I traded my share in, bought a couple of flats then down in Brighton and Hove, which is where I'm born and raised. Right. Um, those flats kind of went up a bit in value over the next two or three years. Uh, bought a couple of houses. Th those houses became HMOs. They became a couple more HMOs. You know, so I think one of the real advantages I had actually was starting young because time was the thing that um, gave me the ammunition to scale up and do the next thing uh, in combination with the rents coming in and being reinvested and all that type of stuff. But it just kind of went through a cycle of organic growth over the, what well, well, that's been like 13, 14, 15 years now of, of the market moving in a generally good direction, low interest rates, things have been accessible. And you know now all this is happening in the last 18 months, which actually having been in the game for a reasonably long time, is the first time I've been operating on some really stormy seas. So that's been interesting to see what's been going on in the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. And the the idea was that you were going to hold on to these properties. So it wasn't kind of like you wanted to buy, refurbish, and then sell and take the cash pot. Was it the reason why you were holding on to everything is because you saw the first one that got up in value and you thought, if I hold these, they just go up in value and I can make money that way? Is that, is, was that the thinking? Yeah, the thinking was probably lacking at first. It was more just doing, <laughs> you right. know? Um, and also budgetary constraints meant that if I wanted to buy something in the Southeast with the money that I had available to me at that time, it was more likely going to be flats than anything else. Right. But I did quickly realize that there was greater potential if you could get hold of a three-bedroom house, let's say, rather than a one- or two-bedroom flat, sure. just in terms of owning the freehold, scope for extending, developing, converting into an HMO, all that type of stuff. So as I did start to uh, have these realizations as to where the value was, um, then I repositioned into things that I wanted to hold for the long term strong capital growth, and also the opportunity to actually create value rather than just waiting for that to happen through capital growth. Yeah, that makes sense. And an HMO, so these are all in Brighton Hove, which is where you're from, and now, but now you moved to London. Yep. So I they sort of started in, in, in Hove, a couple of flats in Hove. Yeah. Um, they became a house in uh, near Gatwick Airport, which is an area I still operate in because of the uh, cabin crew members and all that. It's right, a good yeah, hub yeah, out of... Yeah out of Gatwick. Um, and then more recently, over the last five-ish years, we've been kind of, kind of buying and focusing more, more in London, um, which has been great because it's a, it is a different market in the sense that the rental demand is so strong. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the growth we've seen ha has been great as well. And typically, groups of friends are coming as a collective and they're agreeing two-year contracts and beyond. Um, and, in, and in recent times, we've seen the rents going in a really healthy That's direction. Um, so, so that's that's all great. Whereas that that Gatwick market is more transient. We've got five bed HMOs with individual tenancies, so people come and go, which works fine because they're all kind of cabin crew people who are used to yeah. that type of transactional living situation. But I do think there's strong benefits to getting a group of friends who are going to come and take collective responsibility and stick around for a long time. So, um, given the choice, I think I'd continue to to buy in London. And uh, is there any specific parts of North like? Uh is it North London, South London? Is it East London, West London? Do yeah. you have any preference? Two kind of focus areas have been near the Oval because it's where I live. I just know it. Yeah. And it's, you know, Northern Line straight into the city, Victoria Line straight into Mayfair. So it's convenient for people to get where they want to go. 
Uh, so that's worked well. And then also Tooting near St. George's Hospital, a lot of young professional tenants there. Again, good transport links on the Northern Line, but also what we've seen with the kind of work from home, go remote generation is a change in the market. So actually having HMOs situated near to bricks and mortar places of work that will always remain that way, like hospitals, like airports where people have to travel on the planes. Um, I find safety in that because I do think where people are able to work remotely, why would they not do that? And I think it changes the demand. You know, if you'd had HMOs just near to a big office block, I don't know how well that's fared by comparison to other types of things. That completely makes sense. And with this sort of um, step-by-step growth and uh, a lot of people just want to grow bigger and buy more properties, yet you've decided to a certain extent, I don't know if you're still how active you are, but I know that you've obviously launched um, your prop tech tool, uh, which is called Stacked. Um, So tell us um, why and how that came about and what is Stacked? Yeah, Um, so I think... There were a couple of milestone points that probably led to that happening. One, um, having not been into technology or engineering or anything like that until kind of mid-20s, I actually did a crash six-month course retraining as a software engineer because I developed such an interest in it. And I saw how many industries were just being massively disrupted by technology. And I saw also that property was actually a very slow adopter by comparison to other industries that I was familiar with, like gambling, for example, where there were billions and billions of pounds being invested into taking on these online gambling platforms um, to the next level. So I guess I spotted an opportunity, but more than anything else, I developed a real passion and an interest. And whenever that happens, I've been inclined to follow it because I think it leads to good places. Um, So that happened. Then I did a mastermind, property mastermind program in 2017 with Simon Zucci. And I invested quite a lot of money into doing that to try to level up and and, and be operating in a bit more of a sophisticated way, I suppose. Um, but the sheer volume of information coming at me was, and and, and frankly, the, the challenges so many people had with absorbing that and actioning it, myself included, made me think there has to be a better way of doing this. And that's really when I had the idea for creating Stacked as a tool that could help people absorb and digest all these different creative strategies and fundraising techniques and put them into something that was very plug and play actionable so that more people could meet with success, right? And create great quality housing that's so needed in this country. Um, So that happened. And then my portfolio got to a point where the residual monthly was at a level where I had more options in terms of how I wanted to invest my time. Um, And a combination of all that and how much I was loving it made me think, you know what, I'm really going to focus as much of my energy as possible into this now because there's also a team in place running the property company that means I'm not as invested day to day as I need to be, which again is a lovely place to have reached. Um, so, So the combination of all that probably led to Stacked becoming more of the you know, 90% of my time is focused on that these days. So with the, um, it sounds like born out of necessity for yourself as well. It's like, I'm doing all these different things. I'm seeing all these other people struggling with it. Um, let me be the one that creates something where we can have a platform that, uh, well, what is it? So break it down actually st- stack kind of what, what sort of things can it do? Yeah. Um, well, you've hit the nail on the head cause we use it every day in our business to run our company, right? So we're very much solved with, we have solved our own problem. And as we continue to grow and scale, um, we continue to improve it in order to solve our own problem. But now that we do have a community of clients using it and customers using it, we are obviously gaining feedback all the time from those people in terms of the challenges they're facing and developing the platform to respond to those as well. So um, Stacked is an all-in-one property investment platform. That is the kind of the headline that that we we consider to be our unique selling point. And the all-in-one is important because it does a lot of stuff. And there's so much technology nowadays, there's so many apps that if you try and combine 10 different apps together to run a property company where none of them were ever designed to be used in a property setting, more general purpose, that does not scale well. And I have clients with big portfolios, 100 million pound plus, that have got 12 distant different systems on the go, growing teams, and it's just a tangled mess, frankly, that I'm now having to sort of unpick, uh, unpack for them so that they can have something a bit more elegant. 
And, and I think often when people start out in property, it's such a stretch and a challenge getting the first one or two properties. Yeah. You're not ne necessarily thinking about the long term, five, 10, 15 years from now. Yeah. But the chances are, if you're buying a property, you are still going to own it 25, 30 years down the track, Absolutely. if that's your view. So I think there's mileage in having a long term business plan. So Stacked as an offering is um, a website, an app that you can go onto and add the address of a building that you want to buy. Yeah. At that point, we'll aggregate together loads of information from Google Maps, Energy Performance Certificate Database, Land Registry, Property Data, loads of other places to help you do your due diligence. You know, like give me 20 properties that have sold in the last 12 months on this road or within half a mile. That happens instantaneously on Stacked. So all that's designed to help people get a strong feel for what their GDV is going to be, what the rental demand is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then it comes time to stack the deal. So what strategy is it? Is it a single let, an HMO, a flip, serviced accommodation, a commercial building, a new build? You know, whatever it is, you can select your deal type and stack the deal rather than needing a very complex spreadsheet that everyone's got a different version of that leads to massive communication breakdowns between different parties. Yeah. So now you're clear on the building you're buying, you've done your DD, you've got your numbers clear, it's time to get it funded, right? And now obviously this is something that you'll understand firsthand because you do it day in, day out. And the way I think about this, and very interested to hear your contributions on this, I think about finance in two um, fields really. One is public money. So that is bridging loans, development finance, mortgages. And then I think in terms of private money, which would be the equity piece after having raised, let's say, 75% 70, yeah. from uh, a first charge senior debt lender. Um, and that happens in the form of uh, producing a high-grade professional investor pack on Stacked and either sharing that with private investors, perhaps um, you know people with pension pots that they're looking to invest, or in the next few weeks, publishing it so that it can be seen by a growing number of our private investor clients who may wish to fund that either individually or as a collective. Um, and we're doing that in partnership with an equity crowdfunding platform. Um, and we're working closely with some large pension companies that have got large groups of pension clients. Um, so, so that's how you start to look at a project and say, okay, how can Stacked as a platform help you to raise 90 to 95% of that project cost, whilst of course still having some of your own skin in the game? Because I think that's important. And I think any lender or private investor would be wanting to know what risk you have in that project as well. So that's the kind of the funding piece. Um, and then we can run, you can run conveyancing applications through to your preferred solicitors, insurance applications through to your preferred insurers. And ultimately, as you grow your business, you can manage your whole portfolio on Stacked as well in terms of tenancies, safety certificates, everything that you'd expect. Um, and a key reason why that's helpful is that once we have all that information, if I submitted and started a bridging loan application with Merry Oaks tomorrow, at the point that landed on your desk, you would know who I am, what building I'm trying to buy, um, what the numbers are, what the GDV is going to be. And also, you could have access to all of my existing assets and liabilities and relevant information about me and my companies if I share it with you. And so for you as an underwriter or as a, as a broker, as someone who's progressing these applications, not having to kind of pull teeth to get all that information every time, hopefully it's going to slicken things up and get more deals done. Totally makes sense. Um, it's very, very ambitious from my knowledge of um, property um, going back 20 something years and and my limited, very limited knowledge of uh, technology and tech. Um, what you're effectively pulling in together is a property information tool, um, which there are some out there such as uh, land in sight and um, Nimbus Maps, uh, which um, is the tool that I use, and and a whole bunch of the search land, etc., and property data. Uh, so you're incorporating a lot of that data into the into the system. Then you've got your deal appraisal, so that you've got you can actually uh, run the numbers on a development deal, on a refurb deal, on a investment deal, long term investment deal, um, which is I use spreadsheets for. Um, then the funding element of it, um, which right now there is the price comparison website's not really readily available, actually. That's a kind of a new thing that's coming out a little bit. I've got my own sourcing tool that I've built in-house, which is largely a spreadsheet um, and a lot of kind of knowledge in my brain. 
Um, and then the conveying thing, which I, I, I absolutely would welcome anyone that can help revolutionize that because it's the most painful part, I think. Maybe it's because I'm in the dark of it, and but I, I think I, I don't, can't find anybody that's going to disagree with me that um, it's archaic and, and problematic and, and slow and painful and inefficient. Um, and then the property management tool, of which there are a few. Um, Go tenant comes to mind uh, amongst a lot of other, other ones. So to 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 pull all of these, like people have gone off and solved most of these uh, in some way, shape, or form. For Stack to be able to pull all of that together, um, it's to me obviously being not very uh, in in tune with uh, tech as much as you are. It sounds like um, you know a behemoth to take down. Um, do you ever get uh, daunting, daunted by that that prospect? Um, yeah, you, well, you're dead right. And a lot of the conventional wisdom would say operate within a small niche and solve a small problem and do it better than anyone else does it, right? And it just didn't materialize in that way for me with Stacked because, yes, it was starting out as a bit of a deal stacking tool, but actually this is something that we created within our own business and now we use it and it's just a natural thing to say, why don't we extend it to solve this problem and that problem and the other thing? And it's just grown that way over the course of time. And I do think that there's actually merit in not having 10 different apps for 10 different things, all of which charge per user. So they compoundingly get more expensive as you scale up and your team grows. They don't talk to one another. They're all doing different things. And having seen big enterprise landlords trying to navigate that and see the tangled mess they've got themselves into, I do also get lots of validation to say it would be very elegant and graceful if all of this could happen in one place. Absolutely. Plus, although it's been a massive undertaking and it's taken years to get to this point with our engineering team, and I'm sure many more years into the future to continue to hone and improve that, we do have something that is in the market that people are paying for, that's working, that they're happy with, um, and we're solving that problem in, in, in a great way. Um, and what it also opens up is the possibility to try to gradually tackle this problem of historically one in three transactions just falling through completely. Yeah. And I think a big part of that is you've got, let's say, eight different parties to a transaction when you consider um, the, the, the agent, buyer solicitor, seller solicitor, broker, uh, lender. lender, underwriter, all of these different people. And of course, there's email, there's letters going back and sure. forth. There's different things all over the place. And the workflows that we have now on Stacks, now that we've got a conveyancing application running through to one of our legal partners, a funding application running through to one of our broker or lender partners, we've got the developer on, on board, obviously. It's not actually that much of a stretch now to say, well, why don't we just group all these people together onto one workflow and then have different people communicating and actually understanding where they're at in the process. And maybe we won't get all eight of those parties to the transaction straight away, but even if we get three initially and gradually move to four or five, I do think we're moving in the right direction to aggregate all this stuff together. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I, I think um, it has to be done um, because it, like we're going into the 21st century now. I just don't think that what the way that we're, like uh, I was talking about last night, we are in a high inflationary environment and the two ways out of it really are just putting up interest rates or more productivity. Um, and the productivity thing just doesn't seem like uh, anybody wants to talk about it. Everyone's just like, well, the interest rate is a blunt tool, but that's all we've got. It's like, well, no, we need to find more efficient ways of doing things. And the, for me, working with so many investors and developers in the marketplace, especially helping them specifically with their finance, um, it just, everything slows down horrendously because people are ready to get on site. People are ready to do the business. People are ready to like bring more uh, derelict homes to the market, but they're just slowed down by these inefficient ancient processes, um, which have served us very well up until now. But now you've got new economies like Dubai and I don't know where else in the world that are running on, you know, Singapore that are running on light speed comparative, comparatively to us. And it will take over us if we don't start to embrace and, and adapt to this new stuff. Oh, yeah, 100%. And I think it's worth clarifying that all, although we're doing a lot, the intention is not to do everything. So there are 
companies and technology the providers that we're working on collaborating with because they are doing things that we never intend to do. So for example, deal sourcing platforms because the stacks journey starts when you have a building in mind. So there's some amazing tools out there like Nimbus, like uh, Property Data, like you know various platforms that you've mentioned that I would always say there's a boundary line. I'd far rather partner strategically with enterprises like that than ever try to do what they've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years yeah, better than they're doing. challenging, isn't it? They've already yep. invested uh, millions, if not tens of millions, if not more. Yep. Um, it's hard to kind of try to compete with them. There might be a more strategic way of getting involved. Yeah, and there's there's absolutely no need. I'd far rather partner, and I think that that makes a lot of sense because you've got shared value as you grow then. You can serve each you know, uh, respective communities better. The same would also apply, we're looking at a partnership with a company called Brickflow that do a lot of stuff in terms of working with their finance lenders and kind of their target customer is more brokers than property developers, right? So again, a strategic partnership there makes sense because that's a whole nother world that I don't have the expertise in as having been a property developer first and foremost, not a broker. So wherever there's opportunities for partnership, that's great, you know, because it saves us the effort of doing all this stuff and not doing it as well as other people. But in this kind of central point of where everything happens, that is where we're trying to connect different people and dots together, because I think that's the value add. In terms of the blockchain question that you've asked, which I think is fascinating, I love the Netflix story. Um, and I've read a lot about Reed Hastings. And he, he basically was conscious that when he was developing Netflix, he always wanted to have a streaming platform. But he knew that internet speeds were not fast enough to support that. But I forget the name of the law. Is it Moore's law or Brown's law yeah, or one of these? Yeah. It's, it's kind of basically says that every 18 months, computing power is going to double, I think, right? Don't quote me. We, we'll refer to I, Wikipedia. I like, yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, so he basically looked at it and said, well, I predict that within the next six to seven years, internet speeds will be fast enough to support live streaming. So he got on with building that t technology in anticipation of that day coming. And in the interim, he started shipping DVDs out to people. And Blockbuster was still killing it. But six, seven years down the track, when live streaming was a thing, Netflix were ready. They had the infrastructure in place and Blockbuster could not compete at that point. So in, in terms of blockchain, I think it's amazing technology, but if you look at the land registry solicitors who are still sending things for wet signature, you know, oh my God. we have got a ways to go before people actually embrace and adopt the technology that is available for, for, for being used. But when that time does inevitably be come sooner or later because of external pressures like being overtaken on the world stage, that type of thing. Um, when actually Landridge embrace blockchain and say, I can transfer ownership of my property or part of my property to you in seconds without the need for intermediaries even, potentially, if it's done through the blockchain, that will be a massive, massive game changer. And lots of companies will then be scrabbling to create the technology to take advantage of that. And the hope is that by being in this prop tech space relatively early, like other players uh, are in that space as well, we will benefit from being in the game when more and more opportunities present themselves. And I think the higher thing there is, if you look at young people now trying to get themselves onto the property ladder, arguably it's never been harder to come up with that deposit, justify the earnings ratio to get the mortgage that you need. Well, if we embrace the blockchain and I can buy 5% of a, of a building in seconds without needing to spend thousands and thousands on different conveyancing processes, well, then I can put my 10 or 15 grand to work before I try to get 150 grand and never get there. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that will help a lot with a younger generation that, frankly, have got a very, very tall uh, mountain to climb at the moment. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I hope that technology um, solves some of these problems. I think it will. I think, um, but then I think as well. Sometimes you get uh, I don't know, luddites or maybe an older generation. They're just stuck in their ways. They've been doing property conveyancing, for example, for for many many years in a particular way. And there is a reason why it's got to why the way it is. You know, there's been probably some scars along the way. Um, but is it is it that they need to potentially die out as a breed before um, before we can really get mass adoption? <laughs> I definitely think that there's something to be said for that, right? I actually read a really inter uh, interesting article recently. I think it was in Harvard Business Review or some, something like that. And it was talking about how executive level people in companies, if they're between 50 and 65, let's say on the average, 
how um, incentivized are they to change the way in which they're operating when actually they may be looking more towards their own retirement than starting their career in business. And some people take that challenge on and they succeed with effort, but a lot of people aren't particularly invested or incentivized in doing so. But like you say, there will be another generation come through. Perhaps companies reach a certain point where they can hire younger people to come in with fresh energy and ideas. Yeah, and this yeah. is all normal to them. So I think that that is already happening. We've had the internet for a long time now, but it's certainly there's still a roadmap in front of us, I think. The interesting thing is I, I actually, um, I've been onboarded on the stack and I've got uh, a client also using it. So it's it's already being adopted. And I think that, it's it definitely, um, what do they say, one one small step, one giant leap. So I think we're kind of moving in the right direction. For anybody that's looking to build a prop tech tool or company, um, I mean, you said you've taken years to get to the stage. Can you yep. give us an idea of, of um, what are those steps? You know, how, if somebody else wanted had an idea of, I want to create this technology tool, um, how would you best advise them to take those steps towards kind of creating something? Yeah, that is a great question. And I think that my answer would probably be more interesting, perhaps in a couple of years time, once I've met with more success than I have currently, but I do think I'm on the right track, hopefully. So I would say that there are far easier ways to make money than to try to start a prop tech business or, or a technology company of any description startup or otherwise, because it takes everything that you have and you have to absolutely love what you're doing. To slog and slog and slog for years on end without massive reward, you only do that if you really believe and love what you're doing, right? And I, I do. And it's also solving a real world problem in a business that I have that does make money each month. So that helps enormously. I think the other thing that I would say is I actually wrote the majority of the code myself for Stacked. Wow. So in that respect, there was not a communication breakdown between me as a business person and Mr. Technology person. And that often is where there's communication breakdowns in terms of translating a real world problem into a technical solution it can be really, really hard, especially if the two people don't understand or communicate effectively. So do you have a skill set that you can apply to speak business and technology as well? Because if you do, I would say that will give you a bit of an advantage. If you don't, you've got to think about finding the right people, hiring them, trusting them, communicating effectively. And I've seen big IT projects go wrong because people don't understand what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. So have good people around you if you're not technically minded, I would suggest. I think you have to solve an actual real world problem. You know, there's a lot of tech for tech's sake. And unless you're solving a genuine business challenge, I'm not sure you're ever going to get any, everything off, anything off the ground. Um, and then what also becomes really interesting, and this is something that I'm navigating at the moment, is my property investment company, it makes money each month. It's a conservative business that I've built over the long term and I've invested capital and the rents are greater than the expenses are each month. In the tech land, it's all about raising massive amounts of money in order to move as fast as possible, capture market share, and in a lot of cases, worry about making a profit later, and in a lot of cases, never actually making a profit. And there are household names that have been operating for years that still aren't profitable because it's all about growth, 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 and capturing market share. And I have actually struggled somewhat to mm. decide what is the best yeah. way forward here. <laughs> And I've had people offer to invest money into Stacked. And thus far, I've halted and I've, and I've been hesitant and I've self-funded the whole thing myself. Now, maybe the time is actually right for that if they're the right people culturally aligned in terms of values and it can help it go to the next level. But although that's the prevailing wisdom, I would question the soundness of it. And so if you're a tech founder and you're kind of navigate all of this stuff, um, you know, just think carefully about your options rather than necessarily conforming to what is considered to be the only way of operating. All makes sense. When you're building these tools as well, um, there's, I remember that it was, it was shortly after, it was probably about 2015, I was hearing all of these different um, tech tools, there were, all of them were trying to create a community off the back of, I think, the social media, social chain of, Facebook and et cetera, um, which obviously has its huge benefits. And um, is that something that you also would like to create? Is that part of the whole kind of stacked um, 
uh, ethos, is there a community element to it? Well, there is, yeah, because, and that's, again, not necessarily been the intention starting out, but as you organically learn what's going on and how people are using your product, I think that informs what you do next. So we've had a couple of lovely examples of people come onto Stacked, put an investor pack together, share that with another member of our community, and those deals have actually been funded um, through their, excuse me, pensions or ca or cash supplies. And one lady springs to mind. She's done a big supported living project um, that, that, that was funded through another member of our community uh, through his SAS pension. And so case in point of connecting the dots within our own ecosystem to deliver a project in which six people are now living that they otherwise wouldn't be. And there's plenty more examples of that type of stuff starting to happen. So what I realize is a lot of people are coming in to a prop tech platform, and I'm assuming with the intention of developing properties, but actually a lot of them are successful professional people who are just looking to meet property developers who know what they're doing so that they can say, I've got 500 grand in my pension. Can I maybe invest some of that into different people and different projects? And so we're now serving their requirements to say, okay, well, register as a private investor and actually we'll make you aware of opportunities as and when they arise. And so it's this A meets B situation that we're trying to obviously scale up as well so that more projects can get delivered. Yeah, I think that that's very cool as well. I mean, you'll get property professionals of all sorts as well. So you'll get contractors, you'll get insurance providers, you get brokers, and then you'll get problem solving along the way. Um, I think it was one t uh, not too long ago that we were talking that you were thinking about putting live events together because I think it's great having forums online and they've been very useful to me, Facebook groups, et cetera. But in-person uh connection and, and uh, networking actually is very powerful as well. So yep. if everyone's on the same system and everyone's working in the same way and they're, they're used to a uniform deal appraisal and submitting um, due diligence packs to funders, et cetera, uh, it just, I think, makes the conversation easier when, when you're looking to collaborate on stuff, whether it be uh, the, the investment of a deal or whether it be the, the value add element from a planning consultant, an architect, et cetera. Yep. Um, so that's all. It's good that you've thought about all these different bits and pieces. Um, what are the challenges in raising um, VC finance? You know, I think that that's where you're at right now in the earlier stages. Yep. Um, have you, you've, you've obviously spoken to these um, potential investors. I'm sure people have kind of offered you money as, you, uh, as you've mentioned earlier. Um, what, are the, what are the things that you're looking out for to make sure that one, you don't do it too soon, um, and you, you find the right people. How do you go about that? Yeah, again, it's a great question. It's something that we're navigating in real time without the benefit necessarily of retrospect yet or, or, or hindsight because this is happening at the moment. So there is a company in London that we are engaged closely with called Seed Legals, and they basically advise on the process of bringing capital into an early stage business, and we found them to be extremely helpful. So things like registering for the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme and the Enterprise Investment Scheme, which makes it a very tax efficient way for individuals to invest into a company. Uh, so we've got all of that in place. Um, then you're th talking about, okay, what's the company worth? What's the valuation? Which in a lot of industries is basically just saying, you know, what was your revenue last year or the is it EBITDA times a particular multiple based yeah. on the industry you're in and bang, you've got a number. Well, in tech, it's all about future potential value. So it's very, very hard to actually or accurately determine what a company is worth. It's basically what someone thinks it's worth or is willing to pay for. Um, so we've come up with numbers that people have been happy with. They've made pledges. And then, of course, you're thinking about, okay, well, how much equity am I giving away in the business? And it's not as even as simple as that because you're going to issue new shares each time you do a raise. So you've got a dilution to factor and all these different things that we're yeah, learning yeah, yeah. about. So you're, you're trying to equate and say, well, if I raise this now, how much am I giving away and what could that be worth later? And therefore... What's the short-term versus the long-term view here? And often it's the long-term view that makes your life harder today if you're willing to wait a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's, it's trade-offs. And I think also what you want to be really careful of is preserving the culture that you've created and protecting your brand. 
Because if in any one of your businesses, Sam, you've got customers who know you, they like you, they trust you, they've been with you for years, they know how you operate. If suddenly you brought in a load of capital from outside and they were able to exert pressure on you to do things differently and in a way that you weren't comfortable with, which your existing clients didn't like, it may mean that you bring in a load more clients and end up with a bigger business and a more profitable thing, but would you still want to be running it? And so I'm putting it in those terms to you, but these are the types of things that go through my head where it's, you know, nothing comes for free, right? So what are the relative trade-offs of doing this now to grow a bit faster versus losing, you know, the, the, the vision and the ability to deliver on that in an organic way that's very meaningful and purpose-driven? Yeah, very good answer. Um, I think that a lot of people think that, uh, you know, you can build um, any business and get investment very quickly, but then they don't think about the dilution along the way. And yes, you might solve a short-term problem, but in the end, you, I mean, I see, we see it on Dragon's Den a lot. Somebody's come in um, with, a, with a decent business. They've probably got a decent product, but they've diluted it so early that it's quite hard for any other investor to get excited about participating. Um, so it's important that um, you do that correctly. One of the questions that I had was about multiples in the tech world. Yep. Um, and is it, is it literally just a case of like finger in the air at this stage? It's kind of like, you, it's very difficult to say because everything goes for all sorts of different multiples depending on what it is. It, yeah, I think the earlier the stage you're at, the more guesswork is applied, perhaps yeah. comparables, but it's so much about that future potential value. Once you reach a tipping point and your monthly recurring revenue is at a predictable level, or the commissions that you're deriving from other things, or you know, aggregated together, how much money is this business making each year? Then it is somewhat easier to, to predict. But then also, aren't you reinvesting all of that money anyway? So yeah. how much profit are you actually making versus doing what you need to do to keep growing? So I think that at the earliest stage, it's more kind of angel investors that would be coming in who know and believe in the mission of what you're trying to do. I think the venture capital guys come later right. as more seasoned professional investors sure. once you're worth 25, 50, 100 million and they can see what the business is and it's figured itself out and they can see we can make this a 250 million pound business by applying all these things that we know if we secure sufficient control of the company to be able to do things our way. I mean, these venture capital guys are smart as anything and they yeah, know yeah, what they're, they're doing and they're business people. So... Um, you know, but actually that wouldn't even be applicable for Stacked right now because we're not yet at the stage where I think they'd be taking serious interest in what we're doing. Um, when we reach that point, it's a whole new set of challenges that we'll have to try to navigate. Because it's very scalable is the, is the thing that I, is the reason why tech is so popular in terms of uh, um, investment strategy. Um, this sort of platform, you could take it to mainland Europe, to any of the major countries that have got good property markets, North America, Australia. Um, I mean, the whole world could kind of benefit from something like this potentially if you if you pieced it together and stitched it together well. So the, the future potential um, is, is enormous. Um, and then, in, have you, I mean, it might be a little bit early for this, but from a prop tech uh, point of view, um, in terms of exits, are you have you thought about what you want to do? Is this something that you want to grow as big as you can and hang on to it? Or is it something that you thought, you know what, I'd love to build it as far as I can for the next five, 10 years and then sell it? Yeah, great question. I, I never did this with an exit in mind. I did this because mm. I wanted to. I've loved doing it. I've enjoyed doing it. I'm passionate about it. I need it in my own company. This was not a transactional thing that I thought, I'll do this, make it worth X and get out at, at that time. I did get some very sound advice from a mentor of mine, though, who said, even if it's never, ever your intention to exit and you don't think at this point in time you'd ever want to, build the business so that you can sell it in the future if you want to. Put the right systems in place. Yeah. Do all that. Because the thing is, is that Sam today is not necessarily the same Sam five years from now when your life circumstances have changed. Maybe you love what you're doing now, but you're a bit burned out or jaded by it then. You don't want to be locked in and stuck somewhere. So in my case, I'm not thinking about exit at the moment. I'm loving the journey that I'm on. I'm loving seeing the growth and, and, and fulfilling the potential of the whole thing. But we are putting systems in place that would allow for the best possible exit um, at 
unknown point in the future. And I think that comes down to fairly simple conservative business principles, which is that can we create a profitable business that makes more money each month and each year than it spends hard in the tech world when everyone's spending like crazy, a little bit less so at the moment with the market being what it is and capital a little bit harder to get your hands on. Um, but, you know, I think if you build a sound business that works, you're always going to have options. And the model is uh, typically a subscription model. So uh, users will pay uh, monthly. What's the um, what's the ideal client profile for, for Stack? To like, who, who's the target audience? Yeah, I'll be really honest in saying that we're still figuring that out. You know, I think we're still figuring out a lot of things about the business. But then I think that hopefully is one of the strengths of our company is that we're open minded to accept that we're still learning all the time. So I think that there's two types of client that we have. One are people starting out and another is people who are already at a certain level where they've got a portfolio and they're a bit more sophisticated and they're big, doing bigger deals. Now, anyone who's involved in doing bigger deals commercial in nature um, they're really interesting to us because those types of projects are more likely to be qualifying for SaaS pension investment. Yeah. And, so, and therefore, it opens up a whole new raft of opportunities for funding with our partners that we have. And also, the loan sizes are going to be bigger. And so to be really transparent, although people pay a subscription to use Stacked, if they secure funding, our intention is to monetize that in a fair and reasonable way that gets transparently communicated to everyone yeah. before they get into it. So we have the opportunity to help people get funded and then get paid for doing so as well. Um, so in a way, the bigger the loan sizes are that close, the more opportunity there is for us to monetize on the funding, public, private, and through the various other third-party applications that take place as well. Um, for people who are starting out, that's a very addressable market in the sense that we've got good partnerships with some of the biggest training companies in the UK. And there's a lot of people in those environments who do have intentions of doing their first few buy-to-lets over the next two to three years. So I think that what we probably need to do is find a way of catering to each of those two segments. Yeah, sure. We're probably not doing it as effectively as we could do right now. So that's something that we're really kind of exploring and trying to figure out and, and do as best we can. But that is where I think it sort of is going. Um, and and the, they're the two segments that we're, we're wanting to stay tuned into. And I wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be 2023 if we were talking about technology and I didn't mention AI. Yep. Um, how, what, what is your take on AI and how can you incorporate AI technology as far as we know, what, what we know of it into, into Stacked? Yep, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject area, isn't it? And it's amazing what's happening. One thing that I would say about AI that I don't like about the way that it's being perceived and the public conversation is unfolding is I think there's a lot of fear associated with it. There's a lot of embrace it today or you're going to be completely wiped out tomorrow. <laughs> And I don't think that's the reality. I think that's a massive over-exaggeration in the majority of cases. And wouldn't it be a shame to miss out on the excitement of seeing what this thing is and how it evolves because you're fearful of how it's going to impact you? As with any technology throughout history, if you're willing to embrace it, adapt to it, utilize it, incorporate it, be an early adopter, then I'm sure it's going to work to your advantage, particularly because most people aren't that embracing of change. And a lot of people are going to get kind of left behind, but it's not going to happen today, tomorrow, or next week. It's going to be a gradual thing over the course of the next few years. So if you're tuned in and willing to adopt it, then I think, you know, you're, you're in great shape. At, at the present time, we haven't incorporated a great deal of AI into the Stack platform. We've incorporated a, a great deal of automation, which is, you know, not to conflate terms, but you can already do a lot of things in the click of a button that would otherwise have taken you ages yeah, yeah. previously. So, you know, AI is a bit of a glorified term that seems to encompass everything that technology does now. And that's not the case. Um, but, but, but yes, I think as we evolve, we definitely will incorporate it into the platform, embrace those trends, but it's at such an early stage that I don't really know that any of us have a clear view of, of where that's taking us just yet. The, um, the conversation that I was having last night at this event, um, cause it came up and, uh, the developers and investors in the room were, were pretty much saying that they're using it for due diligence. So they'll go on to, so it's, you know, you're creating an investor pack and you'll have a little bio of the area. And when we present a case to a, uh, a funder, we will typically tell them 
um, a little bit about the deal, a little bit about the uh, area, and then a little bit about the developer themselves. A lot of this stuff, uh, especially for the deal itself, for the area, that can be found online through Wiki Wikipedia and various other articles. Um, demographics, population, all of these statistics are readily available now. Um, and that's what, um, that's what these guys are using AI for. The other obvious thing for, for a lot of people is the, is the marketing copy, which kind of fits into the, you know, creating an investor pack is kind of a marketing uh, tool as well. Um, but other than that, I haven't uh, heard anything more creative, and I'm sure that there's like the crazy rabbit hole of uh, opportunities down there, but um, that, that's kind of where I'm at with it. But I, I actually really like that idea because that could well be the first use case for AI on Stacked, is that although we automatically generate investor packs for people with a structure and a lot of information assembled, the description project overview slide yeah. is people for, for populate that themselves. So actually, that could be a nice way of working something in. So um, you heard it here first. When you see that you go, go live on Stack, <laughs> I will be sure that you get the credit, Sam. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. Um, good. Well, I mean... It's it's such an amazing um, world. The next hundred years, um, I think of technology in terms of where were we in nineteen twenty, and where what you know what world did I grow up in nineteen ninety in the two thousands, and I think about where we are right now in twenty twenty, and where we might end up in you know twenty ninety. Um, and it's uh, unbelievable to think that we are the ones that are actually paving the way for, for the, the people that are going to benefit from everything that we create. Yep. Um, I think that the um, anybody that's taking what is effectively very high risk in technology, um, tackling these sorts of problems, um, I give them my full support. And as I said, I'm, a, I'm actually a user of the platform already um, and... and uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing it evolve and get more adoption. If there's anything I can do to, to help in that, uh, you can obviously let me know. Um, when in your career, whether it be property investment, whether it be um, the technology stuff that you're embarking on at the moment, what's the best piece of advice that you've received along the way? That is a great question. Um, I'm I'm reminded of two pieces of advice that I received at a very, very early stage in my career that in spite of all the changes in regards to technology or the market or whatever have continued to ring true. And they are that you should, wherever possible, try to learn from other people's mistakes before you make them yourself. And that everyone makes mistakes, but only a fool makes the same one twice. And they've always stayed with me because I think that whatever you're trying to do, it's continuous learning, right? And actually by surrounding yourself with all the right people, never getting complacent, being tuned in, and I think staying humble enough to accept that you don't have all the answers and your Absolutely. next big mistake could be tomorrow, then, um, you know, I think that that, 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 in my case at least, this helped me stay somewhat grounded as I've tried to navigate through things. And what's the worst piece of advice that you've ever received? That is a great <laughs> question. Uh, I, I don't know because I probably <laughs> threw it away straight away. Um, I remember buying my first flat and meeting with a, you know, this is actually very interesting. So I'd recently split up from a girlfriend at that time that I'd been with for a few years. And um, she left me and I was still in love with her, right? <laughs> and that's just how it goes Keep sometimes. It, it? That's how it goes sometimes. And so anyway, I remember getting the news that I'd exchanged on this flat in um, East London. And let me tell you, I was so happy. I was ecstatic about, about that. And although she'd left me and uh, she didn't want to hear from me anymore, she was the one person I wanted to call and share this news with, right? Because I guess she was kind of my person at that time. And I did. And she said, why on earth did you do that? You're not supposed to have a mortgage. And she was genuinely upset about the fact that I would have bought a property. In. And right there and then on that phone call, I thought, this was never going to work out, was it? <laughs> this was never, ever going to work out. And so um, fortunately, I didn't have to follow the advice because I'd already done it. But anyone who says don't buy property, I think um, take it with a pinch of salt or just completely disregard it. 
and that's the reason why you're not with her anymore as well. Anyway, it was meant yep, to be. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, and so to be successful in, in property and business, um, what sort of characteristics, what sort of personality traits do you think are really important to have um, to, to navigate through the, 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 the jungle of, um, of, of, of entrepreneurship and, uh, and, and you know, business ventures? Um, few, I suppose that come to mind. I think effective communication is paramount. I think extreme ownership is paramount too, where if you're a business owner, everything's your responsibility and you just got to be okay with that. Um, I think being able to think something through carefully, slowly and rationally is really important and be led by that rather than fear. Um, and I think you know, discipline, strong work ethic, but perhaps more so than any of that, you know, once all of that's assembled is I think mental fortitude and strength because I would be the first to admit that I have massive, massive self-doubt every day of my career. And there are days where I'm on top of it and there are days where it gets on top of me, where I'm trying to go to sleep, my brain will not shut down and I know I need to get a good night's rest, but there's just this voice in my head beating myself up. You're not doing well enough. You're not moving fast enough. This isn't going to work. That's not going to happen. You've got to change direction, whatever. And um, I just think, I think Winston Churchill used to refer to it as the black dog. Some days it was on him and he was just aware of that and he was trying to deal with it. And obviously um, in his case, he, he was able to overcome his demons in, in regards to World War II at least. And so yeah, having the mental strength to recognize self-doubt and not listen to it is really hard, but probably really important. I'm very happy you said that because I do agree with you. And I do really hope that this is going to be a successful venture and it gets adopted because I think there's some streamlining that we could uh, really, the, the, the marketplace in the UK, it's a very mature market, um, but it's being slowed down due to its inefficiencies. Um, and we need something that streamlines us. So I wish you all the best and I thank you for joining us today. And I would love for you to come back and update us uh, and uh, tell us how, how the journey is going and how, you know, how, how many more users you've got. Well, thank you so much for your support. Thanks for having me along. And when we do run our next Stacked event, we'd love to have you along as well, Sam. Thank you so much. All right. All thank best. you.